When I was very young, the Earth Empire controlled the skies. The Tsar and his battle fleet saw everything, knew everything, punished everything. Those of us in the colonies never imagined there could be another way. But then, the real slaughter began. Now there are thousands like me, veterans of the League of Free Worlds, who yearn to fight against the Savage Empire. famous victory at the Battle of Benay gave us confidence and the time to strengthen our fleet. And it gave our leader, the Father, some reason to believe in the future. The Navy was stretched across the star systems, governing and oppressing then transporting its spoils back to Earth. The League was small and tightly knit, able to hit the Navy hard and quick before disappearing into darkness. But when we heard there was a new threat to Galenia, our home star system, the whole fleet felt the cold rush of fear. The Battle of Benay had lifted us all, inexperienced as we were, but now the entire system was at stake. This time, our families needed us. This time, we were protecting our homes. Lights on the seven planets of Galenia were extinguished as the invasion threat grew. We even built anti-reflectors over the phosphorus lakes of Acheron. They'd have attracted the Navy like moths to a flame. And somewhere on one of those terrified planets was the father watching, waiting, preparing himself and his army for the onslaught. Everyone knew the Earth wanted to take Galenia and crush the League forever, but no one knew the Father. In those dangerous times, we trusted a stranger, and he in turn trusted us. Drain. League fleet pilots dragged their ships across star fields riddled with snipers. Friends lost friends, families lost sons and daughters, brothers and sisters were torn apart in the Navy's drive to end the threat from Galenia. We fought on, but we felt desperate. It took us so long to secure Galenia that the Navy had time to regroup and look elsewhere for its spoils. This time, it would try to take Diomedes. League forces were split and struggling. We had too many rookies and a star system to lose. Diomedes was holding, but only just. The League fleets knew it was all or nothing. If we lost that system to the Navy, there'd be nowhere left for the League to hide. The Tsar knew it too. His failed attempt to virus bomb Iris must have hurt him badly. We knew he'd want revenge. Diomedes was resource rich and fertile. That much he'd want to save, but as pilots, we were totally dispensable. It was simple. Without Diomedes, the League was finished. Without the League, Diomedes was dead. The surrender of Diomedes was chaotic, but the full retreat from the system was worse. Shattered League ships crept back to the panic of Galenia as the Navy tore through Diomedes, annihilating large pockets of resistance before they too turned on Galenia. And now, the judgment comes to pass. Dreadnoughts and destroyers spilled through the warp hole, and behind them came Tsunami, the Tsar's personal super titan. I have never before witnessed such a creation. Destruction is its only purpose. It has come here to wipe away the memory of the League and the Father. It has come to wreak the Tsar's vengeance. As we wait for death to sweep us away, 
I can only leave this recording to the vapors of space and hope that one of our kind lives to witness its message. And the lesson we have learnt after these centers of struggle? The Empire is all. It will never be defeated. Never. It had been a baptism by fire for the League's fleet. But now we'd tasted victory, and it was a flavor we liked. Though even in the midst of all that joy, there was bitter resentment against the Tsar. He tried to tear apart our homes, and we knew he'd only failed because his forces were spread too thinly. Perhaps he didn't quite expect the guts and passion that the League delivered, but now he knew what we were capable of, he would undoubtedly try again. Unless, of course, we got him first. How many childhoods were lost around the rings of Selene, or above the surface of Eurydice? Rookers were becoming hardened to the fluctuations of war, as innocent fears were forgotten in the searing heat of battle. We hope the Navy were learning those fears as we were losing ours. We were like an organism, cells working in harmony. We felt that Draco was falling to the League and morale was high. The capture of the Navy comms craft had severed their contact with Empire control. There would never be a better time to strike. Navy's attack sent the League reeling. But we still felt we were being pumped into the enemy's heart. To fly through the Draco system was to pass by the factories and fuel dumps that supplied the Earth Empire with its vast killing machines. If we were to damage the Navy's ability to defeat us, this was where it must happen. We couldn't waste our chances now that we were there, flying between the twin suns and past the prying eyes of a hated empire. The two sons of the Draco system were playing havoc with League fleet metabolisms. Light to dark, then to light again. Our body clocks were beating double time. I heard that pilots flying by Helios were sending messages of friendship to all their comrades before battle. Those in the Hecate zone were backbiting and recriminating before they'd even hit launch. Maybe the rumors were true. Maybe those suns were more than just gas and vapor. Whatever, the tension was real. Pulling in two directions, no one knew where we were heading. The League was in trouble. We were realizing the scale of the threat against us, and confidence was evaporating. Self-belief was draining from my comrades and myself, and from what I heard, there were those in the fleet that even blamed the father himself. Now we were heading for the Alpha Centauri system, where civil war raged between League supporters and Empire loyalists. They had been fighting for a long time, and each side had its own tales of atrocity to tell. In truth, no one really knew what we were going to find. This came without warning in Alpha Centauri. The loss of the comms craft threw us into disarray. Once loyal League pilots were sabotaging our patrols. They called themselves the Faction. But the League didn't realize a desperate situation and we were paying the price. The Empire backed the Faction to the hilt. After all, no one knew the League like its own pilots. The Tsar promised glory tomorrow in return for treachery today, then watched as the League ripped itself apart. There were accusations and interrogations, but how could anyone know which side even the interrogators were on? The poison of civil war in Alpha Centauri had soaked into the fabric of the star system itself, and now it seemed our beloved League was in agony. As we defended ourselves from attack by the traitors, our own supposed comrades, we realized that the rumors had been true. Those who felt there was a better way to control the League were trying to seize power for themselves. Saving the comms craft was vital. At least the command, and maybe even the father, now knew of the threat. The question was, could we contain it? The tiny pocket of resistance was now smaller than ever. We lost good pilots and intelligent warriors to the faction. We lost valuable ships and resources. And to be honest, most of us had lost the will to fight. We'd all joined this struggle with noble thoughts and aims. 
and now we were reduced to slugging it out with those who used to be our friends. No one knew if the father could save us or himself anymore. It didn't seem likely, but maybe with one last push. When the command craft docked and the sellout began, we realized the dream was over. At least, the ideals that the League had represented were finished. For a few treacherous vermin, the League now offered a passport to comfort and wealth. They had made peace with the enemy. Their deal was this. In return for the chance to fly back to the colonies boasting of victory over the Empire, the faction would ensure that theft and oppression could continue unchecked. The colonies welcomed back the League fleet and hailed them as heroes. But as the fanfares faded, the old life returned. The faction made sure that the Earth was serviced with the resources it needed, and the colonies supplied what they had, until there was nothing left to give. Most of my loyal comrades were executed by the faction. Just a handful managed to escape. One day, I hope we might rise again. The League's caucus for peace met with the Empire Command as soon as the faction had been dispatched to the past. The Navy could never concentrate its force enough to finish us. To do so would have been to invite rebellion in whichever systems their battle forces left. And despite the vast reserves of anger and resentment that the League pilots harbored, the Empire could never be toppled by our meager resources. To our joy, the League was granted independence from Earth. However, the Father conceded that as the planet had been the birthplace of our species, we owed it to our ancestors to contribute to its survival. Task forces were sent to the Sol system from each colonial world, and stability was maintained. All my life has been lived listening to the sounds of battle. Now the star systems echo only to the sounds of the rebuilding. I scarcely comprehend it. It's a very strange music to me. These were the sights and sounds of history changing and shifting. Suddenly the League of Free Worlds was closing in on Sol, the home of our enemies. We'd seen simulations of the system, but most of us had never dreamt of ever being there. Now we were closing in on it, the birthplace of it all. The collapse of Draco was a spectacle I'll never forget. In those split seconds after victory was won, I thought the stars were parting to let us through. All systems suddenly seemed a vast and lonely place. After the exhilaration of the flight from Draco, we began to realize that we weren't wanted there. That far from being an all-conquering liberation force, we were regarded as criminals breaking into the enemy's home, and they were ready for us. The Navy's forces had left us seriously depleted. We were in danger of imminent extinction. After we'd come so far, surely we couldn't allow that. We were inside the enemy's home. It was indescribable. They had been ready for us, but we were so fired up and fueled by self-belief that we managed to seize the Sol battle platform ready for the ultimate Earth strike. We regrouped and tried to keep our minds off the dangers. There was no chance of sending out any scouts. The whole system was crawling with Navy craft. And however powerful we felt, we were still just tiny blips on their scanners. But with our supply channels in place, we were getting bigger. It was beginning to feel like a descent into hell. They were dark times, and the fleet was taking serious damage. But the nearer we got, the harder it became to turn back. The Navy was on full alert now, poised to decimate our incursion into its territory. They had awesome reserves of firepower. We hadn't expected it to be any other way, but facing them in battle was truly terrifying. Their hardware was ranged against us, and there was almost nowhere left to run. To reach our target now, 
We had to do more than damage the Navy. We had to destroy their will to fight. We had done well. Whatever happened, the League had broken the Empire's grip throughout the colonized worlds. To that extent, the job was done. But that wasn't enough. We knew the Father and the Tsar remained on a collision course. The Father could never accept a universe in which the Tsar still exercised his doctrines of greed and theft. As for the Tsar, his huge armed forces spoke for him. We wondered what else he might be ready to add to the argument. There was still much to be done before we could silence him forever. Something we should have known. The Empire could never afford to be defeated in its own system. Draco might have fallen to the League, but Sol was not negotiable. The Empire would rather die struggling than allow the League to wrest control of the Earth. So the League fled, sealing the war pole as it went. With that action, Sol was consigned to a slow and lingering death. Reports were hard to come by as we tried to satisfy ourselves with our grim victory. But they said that inside the ruined star system, a civil war was raging. The mighty empire was tearing itself apart, fighting over the scraps that were left. It was no more than it deserved. And yet, should we have dispensed such a cruel form of death on our enemies? So many of them were loyal to the empire by birth alone. Were they inherently evil? Whatever we felt, they were truly suffering now. We could feel the heat of Sol as we drew close to the Earth. This was the place our ancestors had set out from so long ago. Now though, the Earth signified nothing to us except tyranny and oppression. It was a war that left a legacy of pain and destruction. Now it was within our power to consign centuries of genocide to the wastes of history. With one final assault, we could avenge our forefathers and destroy the Empire forever. That was what we believed and what we hoped for. It was up to us now, and us alone. At last, it was time for our species to move on. I suppose there were those in the League who felt pride. But I couldn't dig out such an emotion. I was exhausted. I could hardly comprehend that the war was over, and now I felt simply drained. The unconditional surrender had come from the heart of the Empire. We assumed this meant the Tsar was still alive. But once the drop to Earth had been made, and the League had scoured the Imperial Palace, it brought back only one message. The Tsar was gone. He had vanished. In those months and years following the bloodshed, the people of Saul left their homes and made new lives on the fertile colony worlds. I often wonder whether they find life without the Empire as strange as I find life without the League. Now that the struggle is over and the worlds rule themselves, something seems to be missing. Though it isn't something I'd ever want to return.